in the storm. My name is Mark Matsky. I'm one of the pastors at St. Mark Lutheran Church in Chesterland, Ohio. And it's time for a new Bible study, new year, new study. And it's one that I'm looking forward to going through with you. Psalm shelters in the storm is as it sounds. We're going to take a look at six psalms that have great power for us as we're going through the storms of life. And probably doesn't come as any surprise that we're going to begin today with Psalm 23, which is undoubtedly one of the most well-known psalms, if not one of the most well-known passages of scripture, period. So I just want to say by way of introduction that Psalm Shelters in the Storm was written by a pastor who served in the Ohio district for many years and someone that I came to know fairly well just through my association with him over the past 25 years or so. His name is Mark Etter. Uh, Mark Etter served down in the uh, northern Kentucky and Cincinnati area and provides these uh, Bible studies and other writings of his for free. Uh, you can check those out at 32daysdevotions.com and the 32 are the numbers, three, two, days, that's day with an S, devotions, again, the plural with an S, dot com, 32daysdevotions.com. So if you want to see where the study is going, as well as the other things that uh, Pastor Etter has provided, they're there for you right there, and they're absolutely free and for the use of the church. And so this is something I've been looking forward to doing for a while. So let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll get right into the 23rd Psalm. Lord God, Heavenly Father, with your Son and Holy Spirit, we come before you today, asking you to open the scriptures to us, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, enable us to apply the truth to ourselves. The idea, Lord, of you being our shepherd is one that carries great power with it, and let us truly consider that for our own situation today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Psalm 23, as I mentioned, uh, if there is a cultural psalm that's still well known by many, it's this one, because it tends to appear uh, in movies, television shows, and elsewhere as the type of thing that a pastor might read, typically at a, a Christian burial or at, at any sort of um, committal service. You still hear verses from the 23rd Psalm being read in those dramatic situations. It's got a lot of sticking power, obviously, and what we're going to do today is see for us who are alive, uh, what power does this psalm hold? Which, With each one of these psalms that we're going to take a look at as a shelter in the storm, there's a big idea that we want to kind of keep in the background at all times. And the big idea for Psalm 23 is that the shepherd is there to help us always with the struggles of life. Psalm 23 tells of the great shepherd who cares for his sheep and equips them for ministry. Certainly this psalm has a message for the sorrowing, but Psalm 23 focuses on what the Lord does for us all the days of my life and not just at death. While many see David, a young shepherd boy, lying on his back in the pasture and pondering the things of God, he probably wrote this psalm late in his life, possibly during the rebellion of Absalom, a historical event captured in 2 Samuel chapters 13 through 19. In it, David deals with some of the problematic things he experienced during his long walk with the Lord. While people of all ages love and quote this psalm, its message is for mature Christians who have fought battles and carried burdens. The psalm begins with five powerful words. The Lord is my shepherd. The shows that he is the only one. There is no other. Lord expresses his power to do all things and his love and faithfulness to us. 
is tells us that this is not a past event, but a gift that we will have all our lives. My shows that God wants a personal relationship with us. Shepherd shows how he loves and cares for us all our lives. The 23rd Psalm is for all those who are facing difficulties or challenges in life. In six short verses, this beloved Psalm describes our relationship with the Lord and our walk with him in life. It is a help to all those who struggle through the pain of life or fear what lies ahead. The Psalm brings the comforts and the delight of living in God's great goodness and mercy. It's no wonder that so many people remember its words by heart. It's a psalm that we can recite over and over again when life is difficult for us. It is a psalm that we can use to keep Satan away and to calm our hearts. It's a psalm worth pondering verse by verse because it's filled with images that we can use when life is filled with crises or when we need a helping hand. The shepherd is there to help us through the dark valleys of life and to provide all that we need. He fills our lives with his care and tenderness each day we walk with him. And so I'm about to read the 23rd Psalm, but before I do, I just want to put this question in front of you and let that sort of simmer as you hear the words of the Psalm. The question is, what is your greatest fear in life right now? How does it threaten your peace of mind or sense of security? Again, what is your greatest fear in life right now and how does it threaten your peace of mind or sense of security? As you ponder that question, hear the words of the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is God's word. And so there is a number of things that we can say about this psalm, which we will, but I'm going to offer you a lot of questions as part of Psalm Shelters in the Storm, so that it's not just me talking all the time, but it is you reflecting on what you've heard and applying it to yourself. And so the question that I'd like to start off with is, what do you know about sheep and how they depend on the shepherd. Related to that, how are we like sheep? And why do we need the shepherd? Now, I don't know a whole lot about sheep and shepherds outside of what I've learned in order to be able to communicate passages like this, but I do know that sheep are not great at defending themselves. And likewise, sheep need to be brought to places where they can eat and feed. And essentially, uh, one way of thinking about sheep and their needs is that they really do need their needs to be provided by a shepherd. They do not do well in the wild. Uh, they're just really quite defenseless. And that helps give meaning to one of the most famous statements in this famous psalm which we'll hear in just a moment. So I would say, but just answering the question for myself, we are like sheep in the sense that in 
every respect in our lives, we need God to give to us. And that pushes right up against conventional wisdom, which says you have the power, you have the ability to do everything. You are, you know, all of the potential lies within you uh, to enjoy a successful, happy life, to be a strong person, so on and so forth. The 23rd Psalm actually sends a much different message than the conventional wisdom of our day and says, if we're going to do well, if we're going to, in fact, survive, we need someone who's going to give to us, who's going to lead us to places where we have life-sustaining things, and who's going to defend us with his power. And of course, the Lord is our shepherd in just that way. Now, here's another interesting question. What does it mean to you that David can say of the Lord, I shall not be in want? Or as it says in the English Standard Version, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What would that look like in your life? Or what does it look like right now to say, I am not in want because the Lord is my shepherd. Give that a little consideration. Here's another question that's asked uh, in the study. What does it mean that the shepherd makes me lie down in green pastures? Why does God have to make us lie down? That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Because typically when you hear the phrase green pastures, as that applies to sheep, you might start to think, well, he's leading them to green pastures in order to feed. But you don't really see sheep feeding from a lying down position. So what might that lying down indicate. One of the things that it brings to my mind is the idea that as the good shepherd, he knows that sheep, like any other animal, like any created being, uh, we need rest. To lie down means to be at rest. And to lie down means to uh, you can only do that if you have a sense of security. We can have that sense of security in our rest because of the shepherd. And we can talk about that in terms, of course, of uh, physical security. I think what's being really indicated at a deep level here is a spiritual security that I know I have nothing that can harm me because of the shepherd's presence in my life. So I can finally be at rest. And what that rest consists of is I can just lie down, relax, and let my shepherd give to me. There is nothing that I have to do in order to know that I have the Lord's blessing. The Lord gives me his blessing by his choice. That's the definition of grace. And so uh, a related question that I think is very profound and can have a lasting impact on all of our lives is this. What happens when people do not rest as the shepherd desires. When have you experienced difficulties because you did not listen to the shepherd's call to rest? I think this is a point of huge significance, especially for us in this modern era where everything moves so incredibly quickly and we feel, uh, for whatever reason, that we must be continuously on the move at all times, crossing off everything on our list, uh, inventing lists when not, where none exist, so that we can have that sense that I'm getting things done. And sometimes we have to, understood. There are things that must take place, and it's our responsibility to do them. That's a given. But what God desires for his sheep, what God desires for us as believers, 
is that we have a pattern of work and rest. And when we neglect the rest for the sake of the work, uh, it's only a matter of time before we hit a wall. It's only a matter of time before we experience burnout or some sort of perhaps even a physical malady that's a result from our, uh, our, our bodies being unable to handle the, the threats that it faces because it's so stressed out. So I just really appreciate in this psalm the, uh, the picture of the sheep at rest because we definitely need that. We cannot do without it. Other questions having to do with this psalm. Why is it necessary in verse 3, which says, He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Why is it necessary for sheep and us to be guided as we walk through life? What happens if no one encourages you to get moving? So you see here we have a holistic image in this psalm, not only of rest and reception, but also of activity. And our activity consists of being led in a path of righteousness. There is a way for us to go. There's steps we do take. And always following the voice of the shepherd. That's one of the ideas that is very Im deeply embedded in this psalm is that what is being followed always is the voice of the shepherd that the sheep recognize. And from what I've read about sheep and shepherds in actual practice, sheep do recognize the voice of their normal shepherd. And in some cases, a stranger coming in cannot get the flock to move the way that their normal shepherd can just by the sound of their voice. A pretty interesting idea to attach to Psalm 23. And so another personal question for your own use that we could ask based on that verse is, where do you need guidance right now from the Good Shepherd and why is he the right person to guide your life, to provide that guidance in the path. Where do you need guidance the most? Now, verse 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I think it's largely on the basis of that verse that Psalm 23 has become associated with Christian funerals and burials. And it's, it offers an immense amount of comfort and peace because it first portrays the valley of the shadow of death as a, a scary place. To go through a dark valley by yourself uh, would be tremendously intimidating. But the sheep speaking this word in the psalm says, I will fear no evil for. And here the, it's the type of for that is a because. I will fear no evil for you are with me. Because you, good shepherd, are with me. If I had to go through that dark valley of the shadow of death by myself, it would only be fear. It would only be a tremendous amount of intimidation and trepidation. But I need not fear anything I do not fear in the language of the psalm because the shepherd goes with me every step of the way. So we draw comfort from the very presence of the shepherd who is with us. And there's another reason to be without fear having to do with the shepherd. It's what's expressed at the end of the verse, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, this is one of those details in a very well-known psalm that sometimes escapes our attention, and I want to bring it back out 
and set it before you. And if you've heard me preach on this particular passage before, in particular in a Christian funeral setting, you may have heard me say this. But if not, I just want to point out that the sheep can draw comfort and strength from the rod and the staff of the shepherd in this way. When we know what those tools are used for. Here's what I mean. When the sheep says, your rod comforts me. What we know about shepherds in the ancient world is that they would use a rod to ward off predators. And predators were a constant threat to sheep because sheep are lousy at self-defense. They're just not well equipped for it at all. And so they're very vulnerable. If a wolf comes around or some other type of hungry predator, sheep are just there or ripe for the picking unless someone is there to defend them. And that's exactly what the shepherd would do with a rod. He'd go out there and chase the predators off. And if they got within striking distance, they'd swing the rod and strike the predator and get it moving, get it away from the flock. So on one hand, the sheep can say the rod of the shepherd comforts me because I know he's using that to defend me. And as I'm going through this dark valley of the shadow of death, he will not hesitate to use that rod to keep me safe and secure in my faith. Second thing that's mentioned there is your staff. Your staff comforts me, good shepherd. And here, all we have to do is recall the shape of that familiar shepherd staff. It's not just a straight stick, but typically there is a crook in the end, right? And, and a lot of times today you might associate that with somebody getting pulled off of the stage who's gone on too, for too long or said the wrong thing. A crook will appear from behind stage left and pull the, the offender off of the stage. I say that um, somewhat facetiously, but it's the same principle at work because a shepherd's staff is shaped that way with the crook in the end so that it can be fit underneath an individual sheep or lamb and lifted across a drop off, a, a chasm or a ditch. Uh, that, sh that staff is shaped that way in order to be almost a ladle or a hook that gets the sheep safely from one side to the other. So you see, a sheep can take great comfort from the shepherd's staff knowing that my shepherd has the tool to get me across all of these obstacles, all of these scary situations. And if I'm going through the valley of the shadow of death, that means ultimately he's going to use the tools at his disposal to get me to the other side in safety. Just a wonderful, wonderful image. And one that I, I hope that doesn't escape your attention any longer is this idea that your rod and your staff, they comfort me because the sheep knows how the shepherd uses those tools. He uses them for defense. He uses them to transport the sheep to a safe place. And so they truly do. Uh, and knowing both the tools and the character of the shepherd, that does remove the fear. It removes all fear from life and all of our life and death situations. When our the thoughts of our hearts, the faith that we've been gifted with finds its focus in who the shepherd is and what he will do in order to keep us his own, I will fear no evil uh, becomes our refrain as well. Finally, we get towards the end of the psalm and it there's a shift here that's not entirely clear as to are we still sheep? Are we still thinking of ourselves in this uh, sheep metaphor or are we now human beings? And I say that because usually sheep are not welcomed to tables. <laughs> um, sheep stay in their pens. They stay in the field. We don't bring the sheep inside the house and give them a seat at the dinner table. So there looks to be a kind of 
shift in the image that takes place starting at verse 5. Uh, it, it works both ways, of course. But the table before me in the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Again, that's another reason to have no fear because even if we there are enemies threatening us, God is showing by having us at his table that he desires fellowship with us. And not only does he desire fellowship with us, he gives to us unmistakable gifts of grace. That's that anointing with oil. To be anointed is to be marked. It's to be chosen. Anointing in the Old Testament, as you're probably aware, was always associated with the process of kings being selected. You know, a prophet would be sent to anoint an individual signaling that they were going to be the next king. So to be anointed with oil at the table of the good shepherd is to be visibly chosen by him, selected and given gifts such as an overflowing cup. That's a wonderful image, a great poetic device that shows now that I've been marked, selected and chosen to be God's own, he's going to supply me with even more than I need. An overflowing cup here doesn't mean a mistake has been made. If you're hosting a meal and somebody's cup overflows, it looks like an accident, right? But here it's intentional because it's meant to show that the gifts of God overflow our receptacle. And that's a great thing to know, as well as what follows us, goodness and mercy following me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So once again, kind of the point of this particular psalm shelter is to let us know that what God is providing as our shepherd is not simply deliverance into heaven when we die, but the gifts that we need right now today. Goodness and mercy following along after me all the days of my life. I need God's goodness. I need God's mercy. And mercy is just a very profound concept that's all throughout scripture, having to do with the, the concept that mercy is punishment withheld. And when you think of it in that way, it's these are gospel words to be sure. These are very Christ-like words to receive mercy from God, for have mercy sort of trailing after me that I need day by day to be there. I need to know that mercy is on my heels because day by day I do things that deserve punishment. And if those aren't dealt with, then the person who has to deal with that punishment is me. But the mercy of God is that he has taken the punishment that I, I deserve through my thoughts, words, and deeds, what I've done and left undone, and placed the punishment on his son. So mercy is punishment withheld from me, transferred to Jesus who bears those and pays the, for them with his atoning death on the cross. That's, that's redemption, is that we're purchased back through the currency of Jesus' blood. So I need that mercy. I need that goodness all the days of my life. Not simply to get me into heaven, but right now today, when it seems as though I'm going to be around for a little bit longer, I need to know that mercy is being always credited to my account, thanks to Christ. And then, yes, finally, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. My forever dwelling. And you could make a case for that starting right now. There's a true way in which I am in God's house. I'm in his household and uh, benefit from the gifts that he gives in his household. But that's my forever dwelling. And that's where you can sort of see this shift happening from sheep to human. Uh, I am not just a sheep unusually living in somebody's house, but I am treated as a child of the shepherd brought into his house to live with him forever. So last question that I'll put in front of you today. In this one psalm, are several truths about God 
which are reflected in other parts of scripture. And we talked about that a little bit here at the end, especially with mercy, right? Which one of these ideas has been most helpful to you today? As you've been reminded of who God is as shepherd in the 23rd Psalm, which of the ways that it, it deals with Jesus as our shepherd has been most helpful to you? Something to think about there. And uh, perhaps that's an idea that you would like to then carry into a time of prayer. I think that would be a really great idea is as we work through these Psalms week by week, that as one idea really locks in and occurs to you in a special way, that that would form the basis for a series of prayers that you would pray over the course of this next week is not to let go of that idea, but to pray it over in your mind and in your heart. Let's join together in a prayer right now as we bring this study to a close. Lord Jesus Christ, we do acknowledge you as our good shepherd. There are countless ways that you feed us, tend to our needs, provide for us, keep us safe, and walk with us even through the dark valley of the shadow of death. By the power of your word, remind us of who you are and what your character is. Your love for your sheep is, is unending. There's no way that it can be uh, defeated. For that reason, we trust in who you are and what you're willing to do. Your tools give us comfort, your rod and your staff, for we know that you have decisively defeated the predator of our enemy, Satan. You've done this through your death on the cross when you hung on the rod of God's own wrath against sin. We trust in your ability to use the shepherd's staff to lift us over to be with you where you are. And what a gift this is. Shelter us with this powerful word today and help us to apply it to ourselves. Inspire us to create times of prayer in which we remember who you are, what you continue to do on our behalf. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, that brings us to the end of today's session of Psalm Shelters in the Storm, the 23rd Psalm. Once again, I'd like to gratefully acknowledge that this is the work of Reverend Mark Etter, retired Ohio District Pastor. You can find many more resources by Pastor Etter at 32daysdevotions.com. That's 32 days with an S, devotions with an S.com. Look forward to next week as we continue exploring Psalm Shelters in the Storm. Thanks for watching.